Hey, what's up, my good people? Welcome to the Fight of KC show. I remain your host, Ziki Nyanga, and today, man, I'm excited for our guest today. This dude is inspirational, man. I can't wait to bring him on. You guys are going to be educated. Uh, you guys are pumped up, and hey, without no further ado, uh, I got my main guy here today. Uh, he is a Sudanese-American rapper and actor. He was born in Alexandria, Egypt. He immigrated to the U.S. in 1999, and he settled in Kansas City. He made his first acting debut by, by starring as Pfizer in the award-winning short film, Pfizer Goes West. He also dropped two music projects, 2017, Cash That, and, all, and I Am Because We Are. In 2019, he released a song in support of the Sudanese Revolution. Um, in his most recent works are Pull Me Down and The Strive. Now, let us give a fire of warm welcome to my main man, Rami Dawood. Welcome, welcome to the show, my brother. Welcome, 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 man. I'm honored yeah. to have you today. How you doing, brother? I'm doing great, bro. I'm just thankful for everything and, and excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me, man. Appreciate man, you. I said it. Yo, you, you're going to get me that outfit, man. I, I like that. Is that a sweater you got yeah. on, bro? What is it? Is, is it a sweater? Is, is that a sweatshirt you got on? Yeah, yeah. I like I, I actually like the mix, the, the sweatshirt and your, uh, the, 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 the headphones right. you got on. I, I need to get that. Yeah. I, need to get that I need to upgrade my sweat. Um, yeah. Are you in KC right now or? No, I'm, I'm actually in the UK. I'm in Manchester. What? What you Yeah, um, so my, I got married in December. My, we're both Sudanese. We got hey. married in Sudan. Hey. But she's British, you know what I mean? So oh. I've been out here for spending time with her and whatnot. Between KC, just hey, all over the place, man. <laughs> congrats, man. Congrats to you, bro. Thank you. Before we dive into anything, though, but let, let, let's talk a little bit about this. So, how did you how did you meet your wife in UK? How did that all happen, man? I met her in Sudan in 2016. We were both on on vacation in Sudan, yeah. visiting our families. We didn't know each other. Just uh, we were like friends on Facebook. You know, a lot of the diaspora people connect yeah. to WhatsApp and yeah. groups and yeah. all that. So, like, we kind of knew who we were through that, but we never met in person. And then uh, when I was in Sudan in 2016, okay. she happened to be there, too, and we met up. A okay. group of us met up. And man, congrats, it off, man. Man. Now, that's awesome, man. That's awesome. How, how was the UK life? How, how, what is UK life right now with everything going on? It's different, man. It's different than KZ. You know, out here, it's, it's, it's a little different. The culture is different. Uh, I mean, you know, with the COVID and all that, I just yeah. been, like, at home, just 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 uh, working, just creating art, man. Just writing, recording. I just I'm just ready to put out more music, and I'm excited, man. Let's go. Doing what I can, you know. Let's if go. you're gonna be stuck man. at home, might man, as well lose. I I feel I, you know what I actually feel like really we're really huge right now, man. I'm talking to someone in the UK, man. This is a this is an upgrade for me, man. Come <laughs> on now, let's go, man. I'm excited to have you here. Um, just uh just give us a little bit of value about you know yourself and how you've come up to where you are today, so people can know and hear from you yourself. Yeah, so my name is Rami Daoud, um, Sudanese, um, specifically, I'm, I'm Nubian, and my ethnic group, we live in the far north of Sudan, in the south of Egypt, uh, we are an indigenous people to that area, I uh, had an ancient civilization and all that, and I feel like that's part of what really drives me, because I feel like I have so many stories to tell, but a lot of people have never heard of this, you know, history. And not just that, being an immigrant, growing up in Kansas City, and, and just growing up in the West, you know, a lot of times those two cultures can clash a little bit. And, and a lot of us are, we are the children, we're third culture kids. It's like we have this culture and that our parents do not really understand, right? Because we're a combination of both the West and the East. So I feel like this is something that needs to be uh, heard. This is something that our stories need to be told by us first and foremost. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that's what really drives my music and my art. And, and I'm excited to share these stories with the world. Yeah, man. Um, I, I got to say, because I listened to your song, um, I Am Because You Are. Now, I want us to just give you a little bit of context of what it feels like. You know, in your song, you said that you went back to Sudanese and you felt like, you know, they used a the certain name for you and then you come to the U.S. and you feel like you're not even a citizen yet. Now, give, us, give people a little bit deeper dive into what that really means and how you feel about that statement. Right, so being, being, being American like through citizenship, right? Technically, technically I'm American, but with the way race, race uh, relations are and the way like the system of white supremacy, a lot of us are not really, we're, we're, we're always hyphenated, right? You're mm -hmm. something American. Mm -hmm. So you're not really American, right? Mm -hmm. But then you go back home 
and the people that grow up back home, your cousins and all that, they, you're not really quite Sudanese or you're not really from wherever you're from. And so it's like this battle that goes on. Where do I really belong? Mm. I'm not fully accepted 100% in either side. And I feel like the answer to that, through that song is like, I realized, listen, I don't have to let anyone define me or put me in a box. Mm. I'm all of these things. I have all of these different layers in me. Mm. I'm a combination of this. And this is a new identity that I'm taking on now. I'm both Sudanese. I'm American. I'm whatever I want to be. Mm. Mm. Wow. I feel like, you know, um, in my country, I grew up in Nigeria all my life. So um, I have, there is a, uh, a certain mindset of people having when, you know, they see Americans who are Nigerians come back to Nigeria. They're like, you guys are not really Nigerian because you don't know the culture. You know, that kind of mindset can be hindering to people who are actually trying to come back and learn because you feel rejected, you feel pushed away, where you actually really want to be able to be part of the community. So I, I, I understand that fully well. But I, I also think it's a lack of education on, you know, the side of people who live in there, not understanding what what it means for someone to leave the country and come back and try and be part of it. Um, now, I want to ask you this. So you, you migrated to the U.S. in 1999. How old were you? I was uh, like nine. I was still a kid, you know, so I pretty much grew up there. Okay, so you were nine years old. Okay, so how was that? What, what was the experience in 1999 coming up to like growing up in KC? What was that like? Where did you, what did you guys move into? What was that environment like? So when we first moved to the U.S., um, so the picture that we had in, in mind, or at least me as a child, mm -hmm. I imagine America to be this, like, this. everything is ready. Yeah. Everything is there. You don't have to struggle. You open the fridge and it's full of food. That, yeah. I had that mentality. And then we ended up living in Wyandotte. Mm. Right? We lived in Wyandotte County, uh, Kansas City, Kansas at first and lived there for a couple of years. And it was very different. Those first couple of years in the U.S., it was, it, was, it was a big contrast from what I had in mind. But at the same time, as, as a child, right, when, when you're still growing, a lot of times you're just so consumed with, with, like, with, with what's in front of you. Mm -hmm. You don't really have the ability to sit back and, and take a look at the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. When you grow up, and now in hindsight, you look back, you're like, wow, so that's what really happened. Mm. Right. So, but while you're living and while you're growing up, you don't really, you're not able to, to think about all these different things about politics and why do people that look a certain way live in a certain neighborhood? And yeah. why, all of these things don't really come to mind as a child because you're in the middle of it. Mm. Mm. But once you grow older and have different experiences and like growing up, then we went to Kansas City, Missouri and lived in a predominantly white neighborhood. Mm. So it was completely different from those first couple of years in, in, in Kansas City going to a predominantly white high school. Um, it was just a lot of different, a lot of contrast happened. Yes. And, and after that stage, that's when I could, like, I started looking back and, and was like, wow, you know, there's a lot that I have to say. Mm -hmm. So for your parents, do, do you think your parents had the same experience that, as you had or they had a different, whole different experience, you know, um, seeing the war from where they were or what, what do you think what was the experience? Uh, I feel like they they kind of uh, were in for a shock themselves, but because they had those experience, experiences before, like they lived in different countries and they experienced being immigrant before moving to the U.S. They moved mm -hmm. like from Sudan to Egypt and such and then to the U.S. So they realized right away, like, okay, we're going to do whatever we can to bring up our children in the best way possible, mm -hmm. in spite of all the challenges. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's it's pretty much where you know they saw that this is a problem and i think that that's uh the mentality that you know em every immigrant has you know we see the challenge but we're gonna overcome it because you know uh, it's, it's either you overcome or you die you know so it's like you gotta succeed um so let's talk about 2020 2020 is has been a, a year from jumanji oh um yeah. it's just been the the craziest year um so far and you know what? Let me actually backtrack a little bit. Let's not get to 2020 yet. Let's go to 2019, um, the Sudanese uh, revolution that you were really heavily part of. Now, a lot of people probably saw posts on, on social media. Um, a lot of people did some, you know, uh, some activist stuff on social media, but you were directly affected. You said your cousin was actually shot in the revolution. Yeah. Now, tell yeah. us a little bit about that revolution and what that really meant to you. So the revolution in Sudan kicked off... Um, so the regime was in power for 30 years. Okay. 
and just uh, so many things, man. That where do you start? Um, it, senseless wars. Um, uh, you know, we all know about the Darfur genocide. Uh, we heard of it a few years ago. Um, like, like just killing people, hunger, mm. that sort of thing. And and there comes a point where people just say enough is enough. Mm. Now, the difference this this revolution than previous attempts throughout the years is that there seem to be uh, like flashes of unity among the people with one goal in mind, and that's to overthrow this regime, no matter what they say or what promises they give. And so there came a point where the people went out and protested and they actually sat down in the, front of, in the military headquarters in the capital city and they made tents and brought food and they said, we're not leaving. We're gonna shut down the city, the capital city until we get what we want. Mm. And eventually the military stepped in and overthrew the president. And right now there's the, there's, there's the, this is the process of, of creating the new government. So there's a transitional government acting right now. Okay. So things are still shaky a little bit, mm. but the people were able to overthrow the, 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 the president. I can't say they overthrew the system, but they overthrew the, the president. Uh, and my beliefs and what I see, I think the system is still in power. And unfortunately, we lost a lot of a lot of lives, including my cousin. Yeah. Wow. I am I'm deeply sorry to hear that. Um, I want to ask you this. So, what was the root of you know this president's uh, at the the president's actions of what he did? What was do you think? What was the root of what was he um, trying to do? Because um, I know from my country, we have a lot of tribal issues when it comes to different tribes fighting each other. Um, and also, the, the, at the root of the tribe fighting each other um, is religion, is Christian versus, versus Muslim. Or um, another root is, you know, wealth uh, when it comes to, because Nigeria is an oil-based uh, country. So they want to have a share, a bigger share of that oil. What do you think was the root of this uh, man being so, you know, cruel and, and, and you know, ruling people the way he did? Uh, Sudan suffers from a lot of issues. Um, tribalism is a big one. Colorism is a big one. Mm. Um, you know, there, there's so many different issues. And those issues, each issue would be like that, uh, would, would have its highlight throughout those 30 years, right? Mm. Um, for example, like the war with the South, and today is South Sudan's Independence Day, by the way. They, oh, okay. They got hey. Independence from Sudan uh, nine years okay. ago now, has it been? But there was a 20 year war that, that the North the government in the North fought with the South and their reasoning, the government would say it was about religion. Um, other people might say it was about um, wealth because the oil fields are located in the South mm. for the most part. Mm. And so colorism, tribalism is a really big issue. Mm. Um, if you're not from like from a Arabic speaking Muslim Northern tribe, you're pretty much marginalized mm. and you, so your regions, the regions on the outskirts are marginalized. The government does nothing for them. They don't provide anything. So a lot of people are then forced to move to the capital city in the center, mm. right? Mm. And for me as a Nubian person, although we do have our share of, um, what is it called? Um, uh, what's the word when they, white, uh, what do they call it? White, uh, yeah, so we have our own, yeah, we have our own set of privileges, which I recognize mm. as a people, Nubians are still marginalized because we are not an Arabic speaking, we have our own native language, right? Mm. And so, and so there's this, this idea that was, that was uh, created in those 30 years of, in order to really be Sudanese, right? You have to be, you have to identify as an Arab and a Muslim. Mm. Mm. So they push this idea of Arabism which, which, which caused a lot of people. Like they, they, they don't teach indigenous languages in schools. Everything is in Arabic, mm. that sort of thing. And, and you, uh, you know, you can you only know, be pushed so yeah. much before you fight back, you know? Let me ask you this. Do you know a little bit of history of how, you know, uh, Sudanese uh, became like more Muslim? Do you know like a brief history of how that happened? So we became, uh, Sudan became Muslim over time. Okay. It wasn't something that happened like overnight. And before okay. that, we had three different Christian kingdoms that, so we were Christian for a longer time than we have been Muslim. Okay. All right. So we were Christian for almost like a thousand years. It was a long period of time that we were Christian 
uh, different kingdoms. Sudan was yeah. fairly united, like in recent times, like in the late 1800s, Sudan became what we know it today. But Sudan be be became Islamized from within, right? Obviously, there was Ar Arabs came in and whatnot, but it was the Sudanese Muslims from within that gained power. And at that time, the, the tribalistic identity was different than it is today. Mm. I don't believe um, people viewed each other with the same like ideas of colorism or whatever ideas that they have today. So when you say colorism, can you, can you put more aspect in that? What do you mean colorism? Well, you know, the lighter, the more lighter skin you are, the more you are deemed attractive, the more power you have. Mm. If you look on TV, the, the TV presenters, the women, they're all, I mean, some people might not like it, but they, they do the creams and lightning creams. And there's, there's this idea that, darker skinned people are, are not um, as high up or welcomed in society. Hmm. 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 Even though the word Sudan itself means land of the blacks. Hmm. Wow. Now, bro, like this is, this is my, like, uh, this has a lot of, you know, it's, it's psychological, like it's not like on the physical, you know what I mean? Like having that kind of mindset, being living in Africa is like, it's, yes. uh, it's, demean it because like it's a land of the black people but then there's this colorism going on and i think that's something that you know goes back to the sister system of you know uh uh being uh, colonized you know the system of uh the media you know the system of people being pushed into this mindset of all these things that they, they don't even have a proof of why they believe in this thing but they believe you know so um i think me from from my own perspective, being a Nigerian, um, the issue has always been uh, the northern part of Nigeria is mostly Muslim, and then mm -hmm. the, the southeastern and the west is basically Christian. And the problem has been um, on, on the southern side, they have the oil, but then the northern have the oil, but they want to have control of the oil. There was actually a civil war that happened. I think it was in 1963 that um, the south was like, you know, we we done with this. We want to be our own country, but um, that ended up not working out. But I think the thing that I really and my 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 uh, my, my uh, sisters or uh, my mom will probably hate me for this is that um, I have been you know really educating myself about you know the Muslim and the Christian religion in the sense that because I think there has been an animosity between these two religions where you know it's either one or the other it's either one God or the other God and I think for me personally um, I would marry a Muslim person if if they be even though I, I identify as a Christian. But I think that's something that we as a people have to come together and be like, yo, it's okay to believe in whatever you believe in, but yeah. can we live together as one? You know, I don't know your mindset about that. No, I, I agree with you 100%. Even like Malcolm X was saying um, later on in his, in his career and in his life, he said, listen, he said, I identify as Muslim. You might identify as Christian or whatever you want to be. These are our beliefs at home. But when it's time to come and fight for the issues of black people we're the same mm -hmm. like if you get pulled over the police officer is not going to ask if you're a christian or if you're a muslim you're black that's the first thing they see mm -hmm. and so we need to leave these personal beliefs at home when it's time for us to come together and unite because nigerians having a civil war killing each other where sudanese having a war killing each other or whatever guess what at the end of the day all you're doing is wiping yourself out and you're leaving your land open for the colonizers to do whatever they want with it Mm. And I mean, at the root of all this too, there is always an, a, a play of, you know, uh, the, the colonizers in, in it. Um, there's always power in it, you know. Um, when it goes down to the, uh, I think it was in Liberia, I think it was like, is it Liberia or Libya? Um, when they had like the, the rubber, it was like a, a fight for um, which side had control over the rubber plantation. Um, mm. the fire, so I don't even if you ever heard about the, the, Firestone issue, the, the Firestone war that happened in, I think it was in Liberia. I think it might have been Liberia. Liberia, yes. Might so that um, on its own is like to show you how, because um, I literally learned about that in a business class and learned that in a business class and I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Um, sometimes, most times, you see Africans fighting each other, there is a motivation on the under of another power yeah. that is actually motivating them to do what they do. And it's yeah. this mindset of an, a black man or an African man selling another African man for a dollar, two dollars, they sell you out. Yeah. 
And that is what happened if we need to backtrack into slavery and why we have this issue we have today is a black man selling a black man for a dollar because it's it looks enticing, but then at the yeah. root of it, who are we really? You know, so yeah. Um, well that goes back to colonization, like you said, and, and it's like he might be giving you that dollar, but that's because you don't know the thing you're giving him in return, you don't know what it's worth. Yeah. You don't know what your land is worth. You don't know what the minerals are worth. You don't know about the resources. Mm -hmm. And so when I say colonization, I don't mean physical colonization. I mean, we have to decolonize our mind, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? The French may not be there anymore. The English may not be there anymore, right? The, the, the Dutch may not be there anymore, but we're still mentally colonized because we, we still, really, we follow the system that they put in place for us. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I mean, that's 100% true. Um, I would say this, even in Nigeria, the, 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 the government that they have is the British government that they have. It's still the same. Um, yeah. And that really worries me because we have a lot of smart people. But um, again, this is going to be really controversial, but they are focused so much on, you know, taking money from taking like, daily bread from their fellow Nigerians and not even focus on let us build a new Nigeria with the laws that we want to put in place that would benefit us. A law that benefits, you know, black people living in a black nation. Um, and I think these are conversations that it's not just going to school and getting a degree in this or that. Is do you know yourself and do you know who you are and what is your goal for your people? And I think that's some conversation that no one really talks about. You know, everyone's talking about I'm trying to make money, I'm trying to make this. But at the end of the day, what is the legacy you're leaving for, you know, upcoming kids, you know? Um, so I think this is a, like a, a real big conversation and I'm really happy that I'm happy here today to, you know, uh, you know, talk more about it because I, I feel like when we are outside the, uh, you know, the realm of Africa, we are more united than when we are in it. Yeah. Because once we go in it, every tribe goes to their own house and now it's a tribal war or, you know, a country against country. And that is the, the sickening thing that really is, it, it sickens me because, um, you know, the ideologies I have now, I have to educate myself. And I feel like a lot of people have to educate themselves as well, you know. So, um, let me see here. So, fast forward to 2020, back to 2020. Um, you know, we have seen a lot of things happening um, from uh, Armand Arbery to, you know, uh, George Floyd to Rachel Brooks. Um, and these are just a few names that I've mentioned. You know, we have Breonna Taylor. There's just a, lo a lot of names that have yeah. come in, you know, in play today because of, you know, that, uh, uh, you know, either politi politicality, uh, just, 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 just bad, like just awful, you know. Um, you being, you know, hearing about all this, what is your thoughts and what, what's your perspective? Man, it's, you know, it gets to the point where like so many names are trending that you lose track of, of the names even. You can't keep yeah. up to date. I think people need to really realize that this is not a new phenomenon, mm -hmm. right? The only reason why we're seeing a lot more now is because of social media. Yeah. The world is, is so much more globally connected now, right? So we're, we're able to see what's happening, but th this is not a new thing. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, it's a sad case, but I feel like as black people, when I say black, I mean global black people, but specifically black people in America, we need to really know who our friends are, mm -hmm. right? I personally don't believe that black people, and, and I'm generalizing here, but I'm talking about as groups of people, not on an individual level. Mm -hmm. As a nation, black people don't really have friends in the world. Mm -hmm. There are people who may, might be friendly towards us, but being friendly doesn't make you a friend. Mm -hmm. Right? For example, if you drop your wallet in the street and I pick it up and give it to you, that's a friendly act, but that doesn't make me your friend. I don't know you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times we'll have governments um, or, or people in power might create a certain law that, that, that seems enticing, right? And it makes us smile and happy, but is it really going to bring us real change? Yeah. I don't think real change is going to happen until we really understand how powerful we are in every aspect when we come together. You know, like a group economics, we really need to learn about this. Mm. Because the black dollar is the wealthiest dollar in America. 
black people, I'm saying like uh, uh, spending wise. Mm, yeah. If we decide to just not spend our money for one day and spend it all on black owned businesses, we can shut down Amer the American economy. That's how, but we don't do that because again, it's been ingrained in our minds, whether through, um, through uh, colonization or through slavery or whatever other means through the school system that, hey, if, if there's a black man that has, that has a hamburger stand, and there's another guy that's not black that has a hamburger saying, you better go to the non-black guy because his is automatically better than you. That, that's been in our minds. So we don't spend, right? We're too busy buying like Gucci's and, and, and all that stuff. Mm. When there's a brother or sister that has just as nice quality, why don't we spend our money with our own people to, mm. to help each other up? Mm. So I feel like financially is, is, is financial uh, understanding is a must. But looking at the bigger picture it's just um that the idea of unity and the idea of a, of a of a united goal that we all can work together as one unit mm. now I, I i i agree with you on that being able to unite and you know spend money in the right places i also have you know some th thoughts because um there are i have a lot of you know uh, black owned black business owners in Kansas City that are really doing well and however there are some um businesses that you know the the you know the, the service that you get there feels like you you feel like you are not welcome to even be there now mm -hmm. these are something that sometimes you know makes people be like i don't care anymore you know i i went there but i didn't even get the service that i wanted because you know, uh, and that can also play into making people not want to black, buy from black businesses. Now, I think that well, it works both ways. It's not just the person spending; it's the person that's uh, providing the product. Mm. It works both ways. You know, uh, yeah. businesses—it's a transaction. It's, it's from both sides of the transaction. We need to have a better understanding. Exactly, and uh, yeah, that's true. It, it works both ways. I think you know, um, how do we make services better? Because uh, you know, as much as me and you want to go invest in black businesses. You know, uh, we also want to make sure that the black businesses that we want to invest in actually are trying to invest in us in a way that when you come in, yeah. they receive you in a way that you're like, you know what, I'm going to go back to you. I think there is, uh, and that comes back to um, learning about business, learning about how to, you know, manage business in a way that you have your customers at first hand. And I think that's a whole different conversation on its yeah. own. But I think like what you said, it's really good to, you know, be able to understand how can we invest in you know uh, black owned businesses in you know Kansas City or all, all over the uh, all over the country um because I think that's that's how we can start making this change step by step um now talking about your music um being in Kansas City um what is something what is a trend that you see uh being you know uh you know a black artist in, in Kansas City what is some trends that you've seen maybe something that you you uh, encountered or some things that have helped you in Kansas City? Uh, you know, being in Kansas City, um, the just coming up is, is, is a very unique place because being in the Midwest, like literally in the middle of America, mm -hmm. we have a little bit of every everything, right? We got a little bit of West Coast culture. We have a little bit of down South culture in Kansas City. So it's like you're able to connect with all different parts in America. So that helped me, like I could travel and do a show like in the East Coast. And, there, and I can, in a way, morph myself or, or I can connect with that audience, right? It's not like I'm a foreigner coming from a different place. Yeah. Because of the culture of being in the middle of America, you got a little bit of everything. You know what I mean? So it's helped me out in that way. And um, I feel like Kansas City and the, the art scene is developing a lot more than it has, like, let's say, 10 years ago. Mm. Uh, people, I feel, are being themselves a lot more or they're experimenting a lot more. Like what I've seen 10 years ago or even longer than that, it seemed like there was just one type of sound coming out of Kansas City, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which it's okay to be known to be unique for a specific sound. But I also champion um, and advocate for people to, for artists to try different things. Why not? You yeah. know, as long, as long as the art is true to yourself, I'm all for it. Mm -hmm. And I mean, man, I've listened to your your stuff, and it's really it's really great, great, man. It's like it's some it's some dope. It's it's, it's classy. It's not just you know some random stuff put together. You think about the stuff that you say. You know, you're intentional, and you're like you're a great artist. And I'm just like, man, that is some good rhymes, you know. And um, 
going to the you know to the business side of things i think kansas city is you know uh entrepreneurial business wise kind of thing how do you um you know mark that into your music how do you expand it to that have you ever thought of like expanding to like you know being able to go into like get an investor in part of it or how do you expand your business um working with like-minded people um for example we have a mutual friend who's someone i respect is kwaku six five he's got that that business mentality Mm. and i respect that 100 percent. he actually djs for me whenever i travel Mm. when i do shows he'll come with me and dj for me my music so uh me and him go way back you know and, and and that's something i respect so when I see like people like him, you know, he's a little bit younger than me, but when I see someone like him coming up and grinding and, and he's, he's, he's being vocal about being, about being like financially savvy and understanding what it means to be a business owner. And he's got his hands on a little bit of everything. Mm. When I see that, it makes me happy because I see people looking up to him and I, and I feel like that's the way to go. Like use your knowledge, yes. what you have and, and give back. Don't, don't keep that knowledge to yourself. You never know who you could inspire or motivate. It could be a bunch of kids listening to you and, and you don't know it. So really think about what you're putting out there. Mm, mm. Now let me ask you this. I, I mean, I know 6'5", man. Um, dude is uh, he's awesome. He's smart. I see him in, you know, entrepreneurial events, you know, uh, just seeing him move. And um, I really respect him because um, he, he, he's, he's awesome. Now, um, let, me, let me ask you this. What is the legacy you want to live for the future? What is... Um, one thing you feel like if I have, a, if I accomplish this for the kids or the next generation, I have done my best. For me, it is to put out the message that tell your story, no matter what anyone thinks of it, because you're going to, there's nobody out there that can be a better narrator for your story than yourself mm. because nobody lived your life. Mm. Right. We may have similar stories, even us. Right. We both come. We're immigrants. And right. There's those similarities. But we all have a unique story. Mm. My life is not exactly like your life. And not just I'm talking about even like my own brothers probably have different experiences than me. Mm. So, you know, these stories may get written down in history. But why let other people write down your history when you can write it right now as it's happening in real time? Mm. so that's the, for me that's that's the most important message that I want to put out and when people look at me if there's one thing they can say and that make me happy is that they can say hey he told his story in his own way mm. no matter what I thought of it mm. Mm. man that is that's powerful bro that's powerful man. I'm just I want to if I had some uh, DJ so I would just like pew, pew, pew. <laughs> I mean, that's yeah, awesome thank you, man. that's powerful because I you know, you having a, a platform like you do, it's awesome to have a bigger vision and not just, you know, just do for what is going on now, but being able to have a vision that impacts a lot of people in the future. Yeah. Um, well, let me say, can I say something about that too? Go ahead. About like the trends and stuff. Now, now, when I say tell your story and all that, I'm not saying don't, don't uh, evolve with the time. Mm-hmm. You can evolve, right? And, and because music taste and everything, they evolve, evolve in time and I'm not, saying, hey, go stick it in the past. Don't be, don't live in the past. It's okay to be, to modernize your sound. But at the same time, is, is being true to yourself means like, if you're always trying to reach the, uh, if you're always trying to um, jump on a new wave, mm. you're always going to be in chase mode. You're mm. always going to be chasing the new thing. Because every year there's a new thing coming out and you're going to yeah. keep chasing and chasing and chasing. And you're not really going to build a fan base. And I've noticed that. Because the people that support you for a specific sound, once you chase that new thing and jump on a new sound, they're not gonna, you're gonna develop a different, right, people that listen to you, might be a different fan base, but those people that listened to you before, they're gonna drop off. But if you stick to yourself and be true to who you are while um, developing and, and, and tweaking your sound to, the, to modernize it with times, you're gonna develop a real fan base organically and 15, 20 years from now, Whatever it is, when you do a reunion show or whatever, there's going to yeah. be people there not bringing their kids to your shows and be like, all right, you know what I mean? So that's how you develop a loyal fan base and, and loyal supporters. Mm, 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 mm. Oh, that's beautiful. I, feel, I, I mean, honestly, you, you, you are right on the gun. You know, um, if you are not being in what you do, like, why are you doing it? Because people really want to know your heart and not just what is going on in the media or whatever. Um, and I think that's a, that's a beautiful piece. Like, whatever we do, we have to leave 
some part of ourselves in it that makes it original. Um, now, um, going to a little bit fun side of things, are you a sport fan at all? Yeah, man. Um, when I was younger, I used to play basketball, believe it or not. I'm not okay. very tall, but, but basketball was, was something I was very passionate about. Yeah. So do you watch basketball, football, or what do you watch? I watch basketball. I mean, the Chiefs, man. I got to watch football, hey. you know. And, and, uh, I used to play, and I used to pay attention to, like, football, soccer a lot more. I don't now as much. Mm. But when I was younger, I used to. I think being in America kind of pushed me off a little bit. But, you know, yeah. when at home in Africa, that's, that's, that's the number one thing we do is play soccer. So. Yeah. I mean, that's true, too, because, like, you know, back home is, is definitely soccer. But here's, like, football. I mean, you kind of got to uh, be a fan of football when the Chiefs win. Yeah. You, you can't, yeah. you can't like, especially you know, with the home. Chiefs, man. <laughs> They're better. But now my home's got a new deal too, which I'm like, dang, I'm boy, money, got money in his pocket. You know, um, man, it's been awesome to have this conversation, man. We really dove in deep. Um we really had some uncomfortable conversations and man, yeah. I am inspired you know, by by the work you do, just going through your awesome work and seeing how, you know, uh intelligent your work is. It's 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 beautiful to see that happen. Now, we are coming to the end of the show. Um, I always ask you to do this before we end. Um, I want to ask you, what is one thing you want to say to your fans, young people out there, you know, who are pushing to just keep them going or something that really resonated with you when you were coming up that you want to pass on to someone else out there and then kind of give yeah. them, um, also tell them a little bit about social media or where, where they can catch you at if they need to catch you. Yeah. So first of all, just I want to thank everyone that's really supported me. Um, you know, it, it means a lot. And, and as an artist, it moves us a lot more than people might really think. Mm. Even like just the small messages of, you know, I love your music or keep going and that sort of stuff really means a lot. And actually buying the music and listening to it because as an artist, you know, as an independent artist, like I don't have a label backing me. Everything comes out of pocket. The recording, the mixing, the music videos, the promotion is everything I, I have to do with myself at this stage, right? So when you listen to it, whatever, anything that can help us out financially, man, it, it really helps us keep going to create new music or art, whatever endeavor you're in. So I just want to thank the supporters. Like, it really means a lot. If I can say one thing, um, like if you're an upcoming artist or anything like that, I said just keep striving, keep working, keep developing. Like, you really have to understand, like, this is a craft and you have to develop that crap and there's so many new people coming out every day so many new artists coming out every day and the one thing that's going to make you stand out is you being yourself mm -hmm. as cliche and as corny as it sounds is very true you have to be yourself um the strife is out new song just came out a few days hey. ago you can find it all over um any all the music platforms it's called the strife feature in odyssey and you know give me a follow and, and show love at real rami daoud Let's go, let's go, man. Um, I'm honored to have you because I'm a, I'm a fan of your music, man. I just, ooh, you spit some fire and it's, uh, it's <laughs> cool, you know. So um, yeah. honored to have you here today, man. I just want to say, you know, keep doing what you do. Keep pushing, man. Keep that fire going. And, um, man, whenever this COVID thing, this COVID craziness goes over, I would love to have you in our studio and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with you. And hopefully maybe events I organize, um, you know, have you as, you know, one of our, you know, panel or, you know, you perform and, you know, keep get get people motivated so um again thank you for coming on thank you for doing the work you do um we're gonna be signing off for now but um as he said follow around me on instagram um his new his new music strife is out gotta go start for that music get that music popping it let's go so hey thank you for coming brother thank hey, you for thank you for having me man when i'm back in kc we're linking up for sure let's do it all right man you have all a right bro hey day. take care man appreciate you